Hey everybody, welcome to a special episode here in the Master and Drum Whiskey Room. As you can see, we are not in my whiskey room. We're in a much more impressive whiskey room <laughs> here in uh, Oklahoma City. Uh, we are with Dwayne Poor, who's owner of one of the largest and most valuable whiskey collections in the United States. Dwayne, thanks for, thanks for having me. This is insane. Thanks for being here. I love to welcome people to the vault. Yeah, so I gotta ask you, tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do, um, and ultimately, how you when when did the when did this whiskey collection bug you know kind of bite you? So I uh, for a living, I'm a cardiovascular perfusionist. I set up and operate the heart lung machine for open heart surgery. It's my thirtieth year doing that. Wow. Okay. So the whiskey thing. Years ago, I was a red wine drinker. Love red wine, and got this inner ear fluid thing going on. It's called Meniere's syndrome, mm -hmm. and it causes you to be dizzy. And one of the number one triggers for that we came to discover for me was red wine. So I had to stop drinking red wine and I was looking for something that was every bit as complex flavor-wise, taste-wise, aroma-wise, everything as wine. And I found it in single malt scotch whiskey. And so that was around 1997 and started trying different single malts, different blended whiskeys, different bourbons, but in particular, single malt scotch. Okay. And over time, started buying one bottle at a time, started with zero, and uh, in the last uh, 26 years or so, have a massive collection of about 6,500 to 7,000 bottles of single malt scotch and bourbon. Now this room we're in, this is, uh, is this your, this, this is only about a third of what you have, correct? Correct. This is, I call this my malt vault. Uh, it's mostly single malt whiskey in here. There's a few bourbons, uh, rare ones that I just like to display. Mm -hmm. uh, most of it I have uh, put away in another bunker and it's at my home and I have it secured there, but I have a display room there as well, similar to this. That's some 20 foot tall ceilings and beautiful white bookshelves. And it's a lot of older whiskeys. And for me, it's kind of- Now, uh, when, you, when you say older, do you mean uh, age-wise or do you mean when they were released? -wise? When they were produced and released. So okay. stuff from the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, wow. 70s. Um, more of a, a history of those distilleries. Um, things that are no longer produced, things that were made in the 50s, so even though they were 10 years old in the 60s, they don't make that whiskey anymore. They don't make it that way anymore. So mm -hmm. it's kind of become my little historical um, tribute to each of those distilleries that, that I tend to collect and, and I'm fond of. So let's go back again to the beginning. You're, you're trying scotch, you've kind of abandoned red wine, you're trying these different single malts, you're looking for the next thing that you want to get into. What was the single malt that, what was the bottle that triggered you to, man, if, if this tastes like this, I can't wait to take a deeper dive into what else this distillery has. One of the very first ones that, that got my attention was a Macallan cast strength. Really liked that, the big bold flavor, the sherry cask finish on it. And uh, from there I found uh, Glenmorangie and really liked the, the lightness and the fruitiness of Glenmorangie. And what I started finding was that every different single malt, every different distillery had its own characteristics and profiles and found that I really liked all of them, even to the smoky peaty stuff. In the beginning, didn't care for it. But <laughs> As time went on, seven, eight years went by. They say your tastes change every so often, seven to eight years. Mm -hmm. I really started liking the, the smoky and peaty whiskeys. So I found that as I progressed, my taste progressed, my, it all changed, and really found a love for all things scotch. And each one of them is uniquely different. So what year was that about? Because I would imagine that's when you started you're collecting is that accurate or did it take you a few years or so, so started drinking in about 97 about 05 i really it really kind of just exploded and I, I really started diving into different brands and different things i was drinking highland park and mccallan and glenmorangie and the things i could easily and readily get in the state of oklahoma and at that point i got serious about it and i started attending whiskey events outside of oklahoma and eventually around 2010 started traveling to Scotland so that I could actually go to the distilleries and I could really get the histories and I could learn more about it. And if you go to a bar in Scotland, they're going to have whiskeys behind most bars that we've never even seen in the United States. Yeah, yeah, so you really sure. get to try some unique things. So mm -hmm. about 05, 
piqued my interest in about 2010, I got really serious. Got about really it. serious about it. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's say we pour something here before we get into the next uh, next round of questions here. All right. I have uh, a now longtime closed distillery that they're bringing back to life. Mm -hmm. uh, they're reopening the Rosebank Distillery. Um, so in Scotch whiskey, there's two different kinds uh, of, of bottlings. There's an OB or an original bottling, which means that Rosebank would have bottled this themselves. Yeah, or me, there's let me move this Elmer T. Lee out of the way. Independent so. <laughs> or an independent bottler. Okay. And an independent bottler would buy the cask. And they either leave it at that distillery and they would bottle it for them, or they would bring it to their own area in Scotland and they would bottle it. So Signatory Vintage is an independent bottler that bought this yep. cask of Rosebank. So just so you guys know, I you know I was obviously looking through the collection here and uh, I noticed a uh, Rosebank 20 year back there, Rosebank cast ranked. And I'm just as much as a, oh my God, I could smell that just when you opened it. <laughs> you know, you guys know I love scotch as, as much as I, you know, as well as bourbon, mostly bourbon, but love scotch too. Rosebank is one of those, those story distillers that we've never really been able to, I've never really been any, able to get a taste of. Um, until now, so I am ridiculously excited. So to this try is this. bottle uh, number ninety-eight of two hundred and forty-seven. So they got two hundred and forty-seven bottles out of that one individual cask. Fifty-three point five percent ABV, uh, fourteen years old. Bottled in two thousand five. Wow. Put in the cask in nineteen ninety. Look how light that color is. So that's uh, and I'm, I'm I'm guessing this is all ex bourbon. Ex uh, an entire life in ex bourbon in a hogshead, which is a bigger mm -hmm. uh, size cask, of course. Well, cheers. So, cheers. Let's nose this thing a little bit. Wow, honey, pears, very floral too. Man. Typical Rosebank. Typical for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Initial alcohol burn from the heat. The man, the, the honeysuckle, maybe a little rose comes through on that. Finishes with like a, a white pear. Yeah, this is all white pear for me. It's extremely uh, pear. What's the uh, the apple? There's a specific apple, Granny Smith. A little bit mm -hmm. of a Granny Smith apple I'm getting here on the back end. A lot of honey, but it's 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 delicate yet it packs a lot of punch. And there, there's a ton of flavor here. So when when I'm with a single malt uh, or a bourbon in particular, always one of two things. It leaves your mouth dry or it leaves you wanting more. It leaves that. So this truly does not leave your mouth dry, even though you can taste the tannins from that oak. Yeah. It's, it still leaves you with, with a warm, wet feeling in your mouth and you just want more of the whiskey. It's crazy how it, it almost comes off like it's a juicy whiskey. There's just so much yeah. fruit in it. It's, that's nuts. Man, try my first Rosebank. And I'm very excited that they're reopening the distillery and we're going to get to have all of these. I know. So we talked about, we talked about Rosebank. Yeah. We talked about Port Ellen also coming back. And yes. Port Ellen, as you mentioned, they do a lot of the maltings for the, uh, for a lot of distilleries, if not all distilleries in yeah, Isla so, right now. Yeah. So. Since, uh, since they closed Port Ellen, um, Port Ellen started bringing in barley and, and, uh, producing barley. And for example, down the road, it, it's a mile down the road to, to Lagavulin, then another mile to Lafroy, another mile to Ardbeg, and then the other side of the island, the other distilleries on the Isle of Isla. So I know the first question I'm gonna get from a lot of the viewers here right now, it's, it's, it's gonna be, you have all this whiskey, do you open it, do you share it, do you just look at it? What's, what's, the, what's the mindset here in yes. collecting all this? Yes, yes, yes. And yes? <laughs> so um, my mindset is of my 7,000-ish bottles of whiskey, I own three that I've never tasted. And until two weeks ago, I owned four. They are all one of one. Okay. Uh, they're, a, uh, they're a unique bottle that are gifted to me by the distillery or happened to be a production of just one bottle. And every other bottle I own, I have bought more than one, open one, save one for the future, uh, or I've traveled somewhere in the world just to try that whiskey. So I turned 60 on September 8th. Wow. Had some friends over. We, did a, we did a bottle share, thank you. And I had a Balvini, uh, they did a series called The Ton. And they would take so many bourbon barrels and so many sherry barrels, and they would dump it into a big wooden barrel, mm -hmm. and they let them marry together for three or four months, and then they would produce a whiskey from that marriage. Still a single malt, all from one distillery. Well, from those three sherry casts, they drew two bottles from each to mm -hmm. do some tastings, one in Taiwan, one in America. Well, they were able to do both tastings with one bottle. And so the global brand ambassador of Balvini 
gifted me the other bottle, a single bottle from that one sherry cast, the only one in existence. And I opened it and shared it with about 25 of my friends on my birthday. Wow. So a one of one. So yes, I drink them. I want to drink them. I want this. There is no bottle that I won't like today. Open yep. for the right occasion for the right reason. Nothing is sacred. Um, it's fun to share whiskey. I've made more friends in the world over whiskey and cigars than anything else I've ever done. Yeah, I, I mention that a lot, how um, you could come from any color, creed, background, whatever it may be, and you could connect more and do a lot more over a bottle of whiskey than just sitting in a room and just talking. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing. I say this with, with a bottle of whiskey. When I open a whiskey, like today, and mm -hmm. I put it to my nose, and I smell it, it should take me back somewhere in time to the first time I smelled that, that group of friends, that place I was, that experience that happened on that given day. Yeah. Or it should create a new memory. This is definitely gonna create a new memory for me, so I really appreciate it's a, that. It's a wonderful whiskey. So tell me about your relationship with bourbon. You also like bourbon. Love uh, bourbon. You drink bourbon. Yep. Uh, I know you have a few uh, pretty rare pappies in your collection as well, uh, which I is, do. which I a do. lot of people, you know, when you think about collecting bourbon, the immediate thought is going right to pappies. That's, that's the most allocated, hardest to get, the Holy Grail. Yeah. And and in time, I have owned pretty much every Pappy that's been made. The green glass from the old days mm -hmm. and the Pappy 25 and the 23, one of 1,200. Um, it's, it's fun to collect. It's way more fun to share. Yeah, so I would imagine you insure the hell out of this. I do. And actually, there's insurance companies out there that will insure your whiskey collection just like a wine collection, because they have no reference, most insurance companies, they insure a lot of wine, mm -hmm. and they will cover it uh, you, you based on a price yep. for breakage, spillage, earthquakes, theft, everything. So it's just negotiating with your insurance companies to, to find the right one to cover that. So when I'm covering my businesses and my homes, I always choose a company that will do my whiskey collection as well. No, my collection is also insured. Uh, I think it's just a smart thing to do, especially here. You have these glass shelves, and I'll, I'll, you'll, you know, people are going to be looking at some, some beautiful B-roll of this room as we're talking here. But uh, yes, these like are super thick glass shelves. It almost like when I first saw them, it made me a little nervous. I'm like, oh my god, he's got, he's got like 45 plus bottles of Ardbeg on one glass shelf. Um, are, is this all custom made? Yep, custom built. So each shelf has a metal track okay. that has been screwed to the wall mm -hmm. and then siliconed in and then the glass slides into that where they're made to support 120 pounds each. You could squeeze 90 bottles on there and probably still get by with it the way they're set up, but Yeesh. but I, I wouldn't dare do that. Uh, <laughs> but they're rated for about 120, so I say 90 pounds because that's, you know, I want to be conservative. But I've never had a problem. Uh, we do get some earthquakes here, never had a problem. Uh, the very first, great, we had a little earthquake here about three years ago, and I have a staff here at the office, and I, I wasn't here. And within five minutes of the earthquake, my phone's ringing, they're like, we're, we're in your whiskey room, everything's fine, everything's fine. <laughs> so that was a relief. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's get into a little bit of these distilleries here, because I, you know, when you look around this room, you have a ton of Ardbeg, a ton of Laphroaig. It makes me think, okay, this guy, he loves his peated, his peated scotches. What's your favorite, what's your favorite region of, uh, I should say of Scotland that your favorite scotch yeah. comes out of? What is it? So I'm going to, I'm going to quantify it into the three uh, types of whiskey that scotch is defined in. So there's rich and round, mm -hmm. uh, light and fruity, and smoky and peaty. So in the light and fruity category, I really lean towards Glenmorangie. The Glenmorangie 25 in particular is one of my all-time favorites. Just the 25 year, that's all. Well, Go ahead. It's awesome. <laughs> They're all wonderful. I've, you know, I've got several open bottles on, on the counter here. I, in the true rich and round category, once again, a 25 year old, probably the Macallan 25 year old anniversary malt. Okay. Um, but most things that come out of Macallan, a lot of things that come out of Balvenie, Glenmorangie, Glenrothes, Glen Farkless. They're sherry casts. Mm -hmm. uh, and that richness and roundness that comes from Oloroso Sherry or Amontillado or Manzanilla, they're wonderful flavors and they just complement uh, the scotch. So you think you're more of a sherry, a sherry head? I'm kind of all over the place. A little all I over mean, the place. You, you give me any unique finish and, and I like it. You give me straight from the cask and I like it. Um, all right, so what about Smoky and Petey? Smoky and Petey, 
Laphroaig. All day long, the Laphroaig 30 year old, the old one. So I'm gonna make a confession. I snuck a pour of that yesterday when we were here and you weren't here. Was it good? It's freaking phenomenal. amazing. It's ridiculous. It is, um, <laughs> it's soft, it's easy. I've been lucky enough to have some old Laphroaig just through some friends, uh, old art bags, some of the 20 somethings, which have been absolutely incredible. Uh, but yes, this one, there's so much uh, fruit and sweetness up front, and then the smoke was on the back end to complement it. And when you finish it, you can just sit and smell the empty glass for an hour. It, it, it's just... Yeah, it makes a great room deodorizer. It does. It's, it's, a, one, it's a wonderful, wonderful whiskey. <laughs> All right, so next thing I have to ask you in this room. Now, we obviously, you, you lean more heavy scotch. We have some bourbons, though. You have a great collection of uh, the Orphan Barrels here. I know that a lot of people probably watching are... He's got the entire vertical of every single Orphan Barrel, which is probably co pretty cool. And then you have the, my favorite, which is over there, which is the Lost Prophet, which is actually, did you know that's uh, George T. Stagg in that bottle? Yes, indeed. Yeah. Wonderful yeah. whiskey. Yeah. So when um, Orphan Barrel first did their first release with uh, Old Blowhard and Barter House, mm -hmm. uh, that release was at the Universal Whiskey Experience in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. And I actually got to attend the release of the first two bottles to the world and taste them that very first time. And of course, the old blowhard was never released again. Yeah. And as it's gone through the years, we're fortunate enough that we do get those in Oklahoma. And I do have every single bottle that they've ever done uh, from the bourbons that they've done to all the way through, they've done some scotches as well. And, and it's a wonderful experience. So the gifted horse, do you mm -hmm. know the story of the gifted horse? Uh, I, I feel like I do, but I'll, I'll let you tell so it. So that's one of my favorite stories is, mm -hmm. and it goes back to, I've said this many times, <clears throat> that sometimes the sum of the parts is better than the parts. Mm -hmm. Well, it was supposed to be a 17 year old and someone at the distillery accidentally opened a four year old into the vat and mixed it. So they tasted it and the sum of the parts was better than the part. So never look a gifted horse, never look a gift horse in the mouth, the gifted mm -hmm. horse. Oh, there you go. Well, I, I, I do like how a younger whiskey can influence uh, an older whiskey if you could if you could balance that out right. And that goes back to this, a 50 year old whiskey and a five year old whiskey, sometimes a five year old whiskey is far superior. Price has nothing to do with, with what something tastes like. Just because it's old doesn't mean it's good. Which, which uh, love that fact, because I think a lot of that happens in bourbon today, because there are some five, six, seven year old bourbons that I've had, single casks from whether it be MGP or something out of Kentucky, that will completely destroy, you know, like that Knob Creek 15 you have sitting down there. Yeah. There are so many superior whiskeys. It's not about the age, it's not about how rare it is, but it's about what it tastes like. And, and we, we find ourselves chasing <clears throat> the allocated, you know, the unicorn, the unattainable. Yeah. And sometimes what's right on the shelf, a Maker's 46 or, or just something that you can get every day, a Weller Special Reserve, mm -hmm. might have a far superior taste to it than that one you get. And sometimes it's not about the dollar value, it's about what can we find that's great to drink. I'm gonna say that's hard. That's hard to believe. Looking at this collection from you, I'm only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, my favorite Scotch distillers uh, happen to be <clears throat> one of them is from Isla, and that's Boonahaven. Boonahaven is my absolute favorite, and oh, I would actually, I would actually put Brook Lottie up there a little bit too. Love what Brook Lottie does. What are some similarities you see in collecting as far as these days versus collecting? back in the day when it's scotch versus bourbon. Are you finding, cause, cause bourbon I think still is kind of more the hot thing than single malt. I think single malt, the secondary market from what I understand has kind of come down a good amount. What you're saying is true in mm -hmm. the United States of America. In the United States. But it's a big world. Yeah. So in 2010, I met with a couple guys. One of them was Andy Simpson, who has, uh, at that time it was, a. Uh, a website, it's now called Rare 101, mm -hmm. and you can actually go on their website. So in 2008, uh, his company started tracking every sale of every whiskey at auction at every auction from 2008, and they're still continuing to do that. Our conversation in 2010 was, when are we gonna see bourbon start to surpass scotch on an index going up? And we both predicted 2020 to 2021. Well, it didn't happen. Okay. They're both going up at the same rate. The Knight Frank study done in 2018 for collectibles, uh, luxury assets. The number one in the world was whiskeys. 
mm -hmm. above cars and jewelry and art and furniture and everything. It was number one. And from the period January 1, 2008 to December 31, 2018, that was 584% or 58.4% per year. It has fallen off in the last four years, especially during COVID, to 48.4%. Okay. So a 10% drop, but you're still looking at a 48% profit margin year over year over year for highly collectible bottles. And that's both bourbon and scotch. Did you think when you first started collecting whiskey, it would get to this point? No, I was lucky. <laughs> <laughs> I found something that I love to drink and I found that typically it was going up in value. Yeah. Uh, for example, Macallan 25, just take that. It was one of my favorites in the beginning. And on the shelf in Oklahoma, a 25-year-old anniversary was $199. Mm -hmm. That same bottle today is between three and $5,000. I had no idea, but I did see the trend of this year it's 199 and next year it's 220 and the next year it was 250 Well, if this stuff's going up, I probably need to start buying it now. So I did take to an aspect that I do buy some bottles never with the intent of opening them. Uh, I have a bottle of Macallan 65 year old, okay. one of 450 bottles in the world, part of the Lalique collection. Uh, that's a $75,000 bottle of whiskey. Do you open that with your buddies on a Friday night? No. I bought that bottle specifically to resell it at some point in my life. Maybe never. You know, it may, it may go to my family. Who knows? Um, not in a hurry to sell any of it. So, what's the oldest bottle you have in your collection? Probably. Oldest single bottles, I have a 1935, and it's called McAllen Glenlivet. Back in the day, everybody used the Glenlivet term, that, that particular valley. Uh, but it's a 1935, so age specific on the bottle. But I do have a bottle of 50-year-old Dalmore over there that has whiskeys in it from the 1890s. And it's Holy only a 100 ml bottle because they had such a limited amount of it. Is that that small little? That little small one right there with the big giant box behind it. I that's do. Why don't you bring that over? Let's let's show let's show everybody. Be careful. That's that's the box that uh, it came in. A huge box, little bottle, and it's the only way they did this so that more people could get it. And uh, it's uh, this is a 50 year old Dalmore here. So that's that's th incredible. So it does have whiskey in it from the 1890s, and when Richard Patterson put that together, it was absolutely a. a a phenomenal experience. I actually got to, they had a sample bottle that we actually got to taste that when we, uh, when we purchased them. Age-wise, that's probably the oldest, that's the oldest whiskey in the room in it, but the 1935 McCallum. So that's interesting. So you said, okay, you have some bottles here that, you know, you have bought to have, to hold. Not sure you'll ever, like you said, you're not going to open it on a Friday night with your buddies. Right, right. And I think that's what some of the bottles, you know, can be. Um, I feel like, Anybody that's lucky enough to own a bottle like that, it's like, yeah, am I gonna crack that open with my buddies? Maybe not now, but I feel like it's it's for a very special but, occasion. Th but that could be. There yeah. could be that special occasion. Mm -hmm. um, when I say I have 7,000 bottles, I have 7,000 unique bottles. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got more than one of some, so that still I have another bottle to open on special occasions. All right, Dwayne, so I have a couple more questions for you, but let's, uh, what do you say we break out one more uh, pour here before right. we uh, finish it out? Absolutely. All right, guys, so we pulled out a new bottle here, which is a Glenmorangie. Now, he did say he loved Glenmorangie, so surprise, surprise, we have Glenmorangie. <laughs> a Glenmorangie 12 year. This is, even though it, it looks like just a regular 12 year, maybe pedestrian type of Glenmorangie bottle, that's really not the case. So, what did you, what did you uh, give us here? So uh, this is a, Glenmorangie did a series of whiskeys uh, called the Private Edition Series, and they did it for 10 years, and they've stopped doing that. But now they're, every year they're doing a new release, and it's a one and done kind of thing. This is uh, both bourbon and sherry casks, and the finish is Palo Cortado casks. So something unique that they've done, um, and it's being released, it should be hitting the United States like right now. As far as uh, I've been told, this is the only time they're gonna do it. So. Now, I'm, I love Palo Cortado. I think it, it gives you these really nice like dark chocolate, you know, fruity notes to it. It's all when it's When it's done right, I think it's really done well. Um, this is, let's see, bourbon and sherry cask, Palo Cortado finish. We're looking at um, 46% ABV, so, so every, not too low. Not, everything they yeah. did in the entire private edition series and all their single releases, with the exception of one, the Ulta, was done uh, at 46% alcohol, okay. which is, is just kind of the right hit for Glenmorangie. Oh man, I get the chocolate immediately. 
very much kind of that stone fruit, as Dr. Lumsden, his stone fruit stone that, fruits. He, that he likes to say, and he's very big on those flavors, but the chocolate in this is very oh, yeah. prevalent. I, prevalent. I love the chocolate. So have you done any experiences out in Scotland where you get to go out and maybe dig up some peat in, um, in Isla or anything like that? I've done all that. Have you? Actually, I've got a... I've got a piece of peat right here in the vault that, that I've got that I can set on fire and get the whole smell and experience. <laughs> yeah, we got to go out and, and cut peat and, and stack it and the whole yeah, bit. Yeah, I've been, I've been wanting to do that. That's like, kind of like a dream like experience for me to go out there like work out uh, at Isla for you know a couple of weeks and just stay there and experience the entire, just take in the senses, the take in the, the whole, whole thing. experience is amazing. So before we get into a little bit of what you've created with the bourbon heads, um, I do want to ask you about one more distillery because I see you have a good amount of it and it, it's 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 coming to the point with this distillery that it's gotten a lot of recognition over the last several years. Um, more and more people are loving it. It's got the funk as they say and that's Springbank. What's been your what's been your uh, your your experience with Springbank and your how has your love for Springbank kind of evolved? Been a Springbank fan for a long long time. Yep. And actually, 2013, for the very first time, I went to Springbank, which is in Campbelltown. So Scotland has five regions. Yep. It has Campbelltown, the Highlands, it has the Lowlands, it has Speyside, and it has the Islands. Mm -hmm. So Campbelltown, back in the day, was the seaport. All whiskey came to Campbelltown, and if it was going to the U.S. or wherever by ship, either it came across land or by sea, and it came to Campbelltown. Something about Springbank is the uniqueness of the sea and getting the salt in and out of those casts as, as they permeate and as they age. Yeah, between Springbank and Glen Scotia, yeah. those are two. And Kil Kilcoran. Yeah. Oh yeah, Kilcoran, yeah. Hazelburn, mm -hmm. they're all right oh, there. Oh, Hazelburn. Yeah, uh, yeah, wonderful. Absolutely. So Delicious they're all right whiskeys. there yeah. and you get this wonderful, with Springbank in particular, oiliness. So I actually bought my own cask. Springbank. Oh, he just bought this, his own cask. Folks. This is a 25 year old uh, put in the cask in 1992 and I took it out at 25 years and 11 months in uh, 2018. Is this a, you should just make this a cologne to be honest. It's wonderful. It, it's one of those like that Laphroaig that Jeez. once you put it in the glass, you can sit and smell the glass for hours. We'll, we'll have a little part of that. Uh, a little later? A little later. Um, I mean, I've uh, got another bottle. <laughs> or 192. <laughs> if there's anyone that's going to be like, I got another bottle. Yeah, that's that's that's, that's, what, that's what we're looking at here. So anyway, right? my love for Springbank. I, I know you didn't see that. Wonderful uh, whiskey. Yeah. 48.8%, um, 25 years and 11 months. And actually, I tasted it at 22 years, 23 years, 24 years, 25 years. It just kept getting better, and it kind of hit the sweet spot at 25 years and 11 months. And oh, I Lord. really wanted to let it go to 30 but I was afraid I'd lose it, so I bottled it. <laughs> so you bottled it. So I bottled it. All right, so let's uh, let's kind of transition here and let's talk a little bit about the Bourbon Head uh, or the Bourbon Heads uh, membership community that you've kind of helped and, and kickstarted to build. Uh, tell us, tell me a little bit about the birth of that, where that where that came from, and you know, are these bottles actually part of that collection <laughs> or some of it? So my uh, good buddy Brett Kolomizic came to me with an idea. Mm -hmm. And I had been exploring an idea of starting kind of the same thing with scotch. And that's how our conversation started. And it was about building a community around bourbon that had an investment side to it. Mm -hmm. Well, I was an expert in investing in whiskey and he's an expert in, in both bourbon and marketing and how do we do something that involves community, that we can put a group of people together that love bourbon that we can do events, that we can share that love and make some money and invest some money and maybe. So no, this collection isn't part of it, but we have our own collection. Mm -hmm. So what we've done is put together a group of people and you can buy into it and it's basically an NFT, uh, a non-fungible token, mm -hmm. and you purchase it with that and you become, and it's not about the money, now that part of it is we're taking that money and we're investing in events and places and things, speakeasies that we can all meet and gather. There's also a component of it where we're putting together a bourbon collection. And as an owner of the NFT and being part of the group, you're also an owner of that collection of bourbons and rare bourbons. 
And when we do our speakeasies and put these things together, you will have access to be able to taste some things that you might not ever get to taste. I mean, that's a pretty enticing offer as far as, what, what's been the response to that? It's been a great response. We, we've done several events around the country already, uh, to first to draw members and with our members. Mm -hmm. And you know, this, this last event we did, we had one of our members fly in from Guam, Guam? Uh, to attend our event. Yeah, okay. so we, it's very well attended. It's a, it's a great group of people. We've got a we've got a Discord and, and people are very involved in it. It's it's a great community of people like minded sharing their love for bourbon. And we're getting to taste some really great things and share some really great events. We did an event in Las Vegas. We had about twenty five or thirty people show up for that, and we broke out some really nice old Rip Van Winkles. And you know, I'm there, so I'm going to break out a couple of scotches as well. So you know, of course, that's, that's how it is. Uh, but we had some really great bourbons. We had a nice spread of food. We had a great time. Cigars on the patio. But it was three and a half hours of, of conversation and fun among people that we had never met that were part of our organization that yeah. we've put together. It's it's about doing something as a group of people and sharing our love for something and creating something big. And it's just fun. I, I really do want to thank you personally for not only allowing me to come here and just see all of this, but experience some of these amazing pours. Uh, you know, we're about to drink this 25 year Springbank. I'm like, I can't get my mind off it right now. <laughs> uh, and also, you know, just to, just to experience all this, uh, I love what you're doing. I love what this is about. I love that you share your whiskey. You know, it's always meant to be shared. My whole philosophy is it's not about the whiskey, but it's the people you share it with. That's so exactly right. I really want to thank you for having me here. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. And guys, we're going to do a little bit of a part two of this video series here, uh, where we're going to dive in with a couple of his partners to find out more about the Bourbon Head experience, what it offers, how you can become a member, and not only that, but how you can start, uh, what to expect as we get down the line, as they're building these speakeasies and all these different offers and services become a little bit more prevalent for everybody to be a part of. But um, if you're an extension of that, there could be some pretty amazing whiskeys uh, available to the group. So I wanna say thank you. And Cheers. Colin uh, Solange. 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 Take care guys, we'll see you on uh, part two here. Thanks Dwayne. Thank you.